In this unit, we're going to be looking at water quality. We will start with the water resources that we have and how we use water. And then in the second part tomorrow, we're going to look at the pollutants that affect our water quality. Um, I'm going to talk kind of fast because I know you're capable of reading and you can pause the video at any time and read anything that you need to. Um, you can take notes as you go and, and pause to take notes. Um, so I'll talk kind of fast, but again, if you have any questions whatsoever, if anything didn't make sense or if you have a question for my resident Texas Commission on Environmental Quality expert, just uh, drop them in the comments or email me. So when we talk water, we're going to talk two main types of water, fresh water and salt water. Fresh water is exactly what it sounds like, what we drink, very little dissolved salts. Salt water usually has a higher concentration. Now we have an abundance of water on earth. Um, we're the water planet. It exists in solid, liquid, and gas form all over the place. It's a renewable resource because we have the water cycle that, that cycles it. Um, but even still, there is a concern of, of how we use it and how we take care of it. So you've all seen the water cycle since you were like in first grade, you know, condensation, evaporation, um, precipitation, and, and how it all cycles through this system. Um, water pollution can exist at any point in this cycle and can affect any, any part along the path here. Um, even though 71% of the surface is covered with water, only 97, or sorry, 97% of that is salt water, only 3% is actually fresh water. And of that tiny 3% fresh water, 77% of that is frozen where we can't really get to it. So what we can use is just a teeny tiny percentage of the total amount of water that exists on earth. So we usually use surface water, rivers, lakes, streams, wetlands, that's usually what humans are going to pull and use, um, not necessarily just for drinking water, but for fishing, for recreation, for industry, um, even for transportation, um, as you can see the boat down here. So we have to really think about our surface water and how we're using it and using it wisely. Um, one thing we talked about when we talked about the hydrosphere, but I know that was way back in September, is we talked about river systems. Um, water falls to the ground as, condens as precipitation and then it flows and collects and drains off of the water and forms these big river systems that collect, um, collect that water and take it eventually to a bigger body of water, either the, a lake like the Great Lakes or the Gulf of Mexico or an ocean. Um, our largest river system in the world is the Amazon River. In North America is the Mississippi River and here is a map showing you the river system, the watershed that is drained by the Mississippi River. Um, it's important to look at these river systems and how they connect because any amount of pollution that exists at any part of this watershed can end up polluting all the water that occurs downstream and eventually in, into the ocean. Now we can also use groundwater. Groundwater is water that occurs beneath the ground in the pore spaces of the sediment or a rock layer. Um, we talk about finding the water table if you drill down to make a well that's that level at which you reach the saturation point where you found water um, sometimes that water table will intersect the the surface if the ground slopes and you get what's called a spring so some of our spring water is just where the water table meets a, a slope in the earth surface um, it's important to remember that groundwater, our aquifers are not flat, they're, they're not real tables. Um, since the land contours, we've got hills and valleys and mountains, so does the rock layer underneath it. Um, so as it flows from one place to another, then it undergoes filtration and, and moves, it migrates from one place to another. An aquifer is just simply an underground formation that's capable of containing groundwater that we can get to. Um, it could be sandstone, it could be cracked limestone, um, it could be where the limestone has been dissolved away and now you have a big hole like a cave or an underground lake. Um, but that's an aquifer and that's what we get to to use for a lot of our, our groundwater. Um, aquifers are useful to us if they have porosity and if they have permeability. So porosity, think pore spaces, that's how much of the rock is open. The more porous it is, the more water it can hold. So think like the holes in a sponge. It's very porous, it will hold a lot of water. Permeability is how connected those pore spaces are. If it's very permeable, then it will flow very easily and you can get the water out. 
if it's not very permeable, even if it has plenty of pore spaces, but they're very poorly connected, poorly, yeah, um, then you can't get the water out of the rock, and so it's not very useful. The best aquifers are both porous and permeable. Aquifers, like we said here, um, you can see flow with the topography of the land. You have some areas that are maybe pushed up like in a mountain range or dipped down like in a valley. Um, so when you're looking for water, when you're trying to find that water, it's important to remember that, that it flows from one place to another and collects in certain areas just like surface water does. Where that water flows into our aquifer, where it goes down into the sand and soil underneath us, is called the recharge zone. And it's really important to um, take care of these recharge zones. They're very environmentally sensitive because anything that soaks down into the ground um, eventually percolates down into the aquifer, including pollutants. Um, if we don't have those recharge zones, if we pave over them with impermeable layers like concrete, asphalt, then we reduce the amount of water that's soaking into our aquifer and we reduce the amount of water that we can use later. Um, communities like around San Antonio, they carefully manage those recharge zones. Um, the Ogallala Aquifer up in Kansas, Nebraska, like the central United States has been under great concern recently because of how much water is pumped out of the central states um, for agriculture, for irrigation. So we have to manage those recharge and let them fill back up, not overuse that resource and not pollute them at the same time because we don't want those pesticides or those heavy minerals to make their way all the way down into water that we're planning to drink or, or spray on our crops later. Um, but they do take lots of time to recharge. It's not something that, you know, you, it soaks into the ground and three months later you take it out. It's sometimes up to tens of thousands of years to completely recharge. Um, so in that way, you can think of it like fossil fuels. Yes, it will remake itself, but is it going to be during our lifetime? So to get to the water down in the groundwater, um, down under the ground, we dig wells. A well could be something very simple like you see in the picture here on the left, um, or it could be a professional well just like you would think of a um, one of those oil pumps. It could be very professional like that. Um, if the water table falls below the bottom of the well, think of it like sticking your straw in an icy that you get from the convenience store. If it falls down below it, you got to stick your straw down farther, right? So if the well dries up, you have to dig your well deeper. Eventually, you might run out of well. You might run out of, of water there. Um, when the water supply is used up, when it's polluted, when it's no longer useful to us, then everyone is affected. Um, there is... Uh, there are a lot of communities in our world that do not have access to clean, fresh water. Um, there are about 2 billion people that lack safe water. 800 million people just do not have reliable, fresh water to begin with. Um, a lot of time is spent finding and gathering water to use by a family. And so if we can find ways to protect our water resources, both the amount and the cleanliness, then we can go a long way into solving a lot of our, our poverty problems and our, our problems with, um, with economic um, instability. How we use water varies by location. Um, we have we can break it down into three main uses our residential what people use to live day to day agricultural growing crops and we can even lump animals in there as well and then our industrial use what we use for manufacturing for generating electricity so the way that we use water depends on how much water we have um, how much population we have needing it and then the economic conditions we live under in the United States, the average person uses 80 gallons of water a day. Now that's not all coming out of your tap, that's per capita distributed among all of us, including the electricity that they use, the water that they use to generate electricity, the water that they use for industrial processes. This is distributing among all of us. Um, but in our homes, we use showers, we wash clothes, we wash dishes, we flush the toilet, we take baths, uh, we water our lawns. Uh, we use a lot of water. In India, it's only 11 gallons. Um, they use a lot less, they waste a lot less because they have more people and less water to go around. 
Um, your water has to be treated in order to make it potable. Potable means safe to drink. Um, that removes any elements that are harmful to people as well as any pathogens like bacteria um, or um, viruses or whatnot that could cause illness or could cause disease. So this is the process of water treatment. Over here, number one, you take the water in from a local source. It could be surface water like in this picture or it could be groundwater. Clarification removes the solids, the sediment that's floating in the water. Um, disinfection takes out the pathogens, the bacteria and whatnot. Um, you remove any of the rest of that, let it settle out, filter it, store it until it's needed, and then distribute it to your people. If we get back into school, my plan is to take you to the Tyler Water Treatment Plant, but again, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, and then wastewater, once we use it and it goes down the drain, down the sink, down the sewer, then it goes to a wastewater treatment plant and it has to be filtered to make it clean enough to return to a lake, river, or ocean. It's not necessarily drinking water safe, but it is safe to put back into the nearest creek, river, lake, whatever. Um, when they take the solids out, whether that's what got flushed down the toilet or down the drain in the shower or what went down the storm drain, the solids that they filter out is called sewage sludge and they have to plan for how that is going to be treated after the water is treated. So they could take that to a landfill and, or, and bury it or they could take it to an incinerator and burn it depending on your location and what, what they choose to do. Um, industrially, water is used for manufacturing goods, for disposing of the waste, and for generating electricity. Um, there is Texas Eastman in Longview. Here is their site, and you notice all around Eastman you have these canals. Um, and so these canals are used, I'm sorry, this is not Texas Eastman, I was thinking that looked funny. <laughs> this is Exxon and Port Arthur. Exxon and Port Arthur very similar to Eastman, they both have bayous around them, um, but this one's actually Port Arthur. The bayou around them is where they pull in water for cooling their processing plant. Eastman does the same thing, this is just not them. You can see the little Port Arthur over there, sorry. Um, but yes, your industrial areas, no matter what city they're in, um, will probably be near a water source, whether it's man-made like this canal, or whether it's a natural water source like Taylor Bayou over here, um, because they will use that water for using, um, they will use it for manufacturing or for generating electricity or for cooling um, their equipment. Agriculturally, we use a lot of water too. Um, plants require a lot of water to grow and animals need to drink water as well. As much as 80% of the water that's used in irrigation evaporates and never reaches the plant roots. So not only is it a waste of water, but it's also a waste of money because farmers are having to pay for their water usage. Um, so there's a couple of ways that we can change that. We can go from having either ditches or overhead sprinklers to using more like a drip irrigation system or um, something that sprays it a lot closer to the plant so that a lot more of it makes it to the plant roots and doesn't blow away or evaporate. So we're becoming a lot better with irrigation, a lot more efficient. Um, especially as the aquifers become depleted and that becomes a, a big challenge for us. To get water to where it's needed, we can use canals to divert water. You might notice these a lot in South Texas where they will take it um, from bayous over to cities to use it. Um, they might even create reservoirs like we did at Lake Tyler to control the flooding to back up a creek or a river and hold that water until it's needed for either flood control, for, sorry, for drinking water, for irrigation, for recreation, for industry. Um, the only problems like we talked about when we talked about hydroelectric dams is that ecological disruption. You did have a river and now you've got a lake. So in the future we want to conserve water, we want to use better um, water filtration sources, we can do that at home as well with shorter showers, um, planting for crops that don't take as much water. And we're also looking at ways of desalinization, taking salt water and purifying it to become fresh water. So there's a lot more communities that are starting to look at this. It's just so expensive. So tomorrow we'll talk about pollution, um, where it comes from, how it affects us, and how we can prevent it. So see you all tomorrow.